This program is powered by the Virtual Show, making your offline events virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, the host of Web and Virtual, Dr. Plamen Rusev. And hello, wonderful Web community. It's uh, Monday, unusual day for a Webby Tower, but a wonderful day for a great event with some wonderful people uh, that I will be announcing one by after another, and I'm sure you're going to spend the next one hour exploring all about the digital entertainment and media industry in a very condensed format. There will be uh, a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, many different players from the ecosystem. Uh, some of them big winners, others need to transform. All of this in the next 60 minutes of Web Virtual starting the digital entertainment in media week. Four events, one after another, with four fantastic, spe uh, sorry, <laughs> more than 20 fantastic speakers, some of the best startups in the area, and uh, investors who are also going to be checking. So we have industry players, investors, startups and founders, and media all together in this great week on digital entertainment and media. I am very impatient to see how many of you are with us already. And I see 4,400 people out of less than 3,000 registered today. That's quite a good start. 4,000 concurring for the start of our digital meeting today. Just a few words, some great news coming out uh, from uh, and for Webit. And for our partners, the digital, uh, the virtual show, Forbes announced Webit as the biggest virtual digital plot, thought leadership platform in the world. And also mentioned that the virtual show is among the top three virtualization platforms. It's great. That's why it's very important to pick the right partners to make your digital next digital move ahead. Without further ado, uh, because I do appreciate your time really a lot. I would like to introduce you to my first guest in the studio. Maria Rua Aguet is an executive director at Omdia, the global technology research powerhouse. She leads the strategic development focusing on media, service providers and platforms, and manages the day-to-day -day operations of the media team, tracking the evolution of global service providers and operators. Their research on service providers leverages long-standing relationships with operators in all 100-plus markets covered by them, resulting in the most comprehensive source of television and operator market intelligence in the world. Maria, you're legendary. Your business card is uh, longer than anyone we have played so far. Thank you so much for joining us in our virtual studio. Thank you very much, uh, Pramin. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with all of you. Thank you for the invite. Uh, it is uh, our pleasure, Maria. Muchas gracias for joining. And um, I said you're legendary and I meant it because um, the industry knows that if you are with us, this means a lot of numbers, a lot of important information, and definitely a great opportunity for everyone to set their time, uh, both time zones and watches, uh, and to set for the right trends. So without further ado, I'm, again, I'm very grateful for you being part of our uh, Global Impact Board and particularly in the Committee for Digital Entertainment and, uh, and uh, Media, which uh, in its offline version is chaired by another very dear friend of mine and uh, someone who is joining us a little bit later after your numbers here. So let's start. Uh, the floor is yours, Maria. I know COVID has made a lot of changes in the industry, but in your industry, uh, I think predominantly more positive than negative, but most probably you will correct me if I'm wrong. The floor is yours. Correct. Yes. Thank you very much for this introduction, because as you said, I like to put numbers. I like to provide evidence to tell the world what is really happening uh, during COVID and now that we are coming out of lockdown. So for that, uh, I will use a lot of statistics, lots of numbers. Uh, I would like to introduce my next guest now in the studio. Um, here he is. 
Stanislav Georgiev is a senior industry executive and influencer in the global media, content and broadcast industries. He is the chief executive officer of Vusat.com, Bulgaria's number one pay TV provider and also the chairman of Webit Dems Board. Before taking over the leadership of Vusat.com, Mr. Georgiev had been engaged as a senior advisor at Arthur D. Little, working with the management boards of top media companies across Europe, MENA and Asia on their business development strategies, growth and transformation. Stanley, welcome to Webit. How are you? I'm very good, Plavan. It's great to be here. Uh, good afternoon to whoever is in Europe. Good morning to whoever is in the US. It's pleasure to be again uh, on the Webit stage, even though it's, it's virtual. Been a while. It has been a while, but uh, congratulations, Plumman, for bringing this platform. And uh, I, I was really eager uh, for the week for the digital entertainment and media to arrive, and there it is. So I'm very happy to be around. Indeed, Stanley. We also are very excited about the content that we coming up next. We have uh, CEOs of large media like Forbes and others. We have some top producers, and uh, of course, we have you guys here with us. So um, um, I will I will start with a simple question. You have moved. You've switched roles from uh, being on the um, uh, more technical part of the equation, being part of the Austria Telecom, now running. Um, one um, um, operator, which obviously is a, is a completely new uh, shoes that you wear. Uh, and uh, you see the industry already almost 360 degrees. So how was COVID uh, impacting the industry of digital entertainment and media through your eyes? Well, <laughs> there is not a simple answer to this uh, very simple question. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> for, first of all, I would say that everyone is learning on the fly. Uh, this is the thing about COVID that it came completely unannounced and the whole industry transformed, the whole world transformed. And I think that we are still making the baby steps anywhere worldwide. I mean, health system and transport, etc., in figuring out what is next. So practically whatever it is today we're not even sure it's going to be tomorrow uh, but still i think the biggest learning uh, for us all was that we should be ready to adapt and the adaptation becomes via digitalization so whoever was digitalized whoever had uh, digital channels in the um, media and entertainment industry uh, whoever had no need anymore to make physical contact uh, with regards to physical installations, uh, etc. Uh, those uh, those companies thrived. I mean, this is the big learning. So practically, perhaps one of the industries that was not that negatively impacted was our industry, the digital media and entertainment. Why? Because we are practically in the entertainment business. I mean, we have always been fighting for the eyes of the, of the viewers. And now we got them. We got them locked. Uh, we got all of these viewers locked in their houses. Yeah, you left them with, they, they were left with no choice, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So whatever normally we would fight for, more screen time, uh, more interaction, etc., we got it as granted. I mean, this is the good news. Uh, there were several things actually that were not that fantastic. Uh, and this was life, life events. I mean, uh, we all know that, and I'm, I'm really sorry that I'm stealing the stage from Maria a little bit, but uh, whatever I say now, she will uh, back up with numbers. I thought uh, you're going to say, I'm very sorry for, for telling this to you because we are the ones that suffered. We were supposed to have our event uh, just three days ago in uh, in Spain. So yeah. yes. By the way, go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean the whole uh, the whole industry is, you know, everyone talks about cord cutting. Everyone talks about uh, linear versus non-linear delivery of content, and practically what has been keeping the broadcast industry alive 
has been live events and live sports and uh, broadcast studios and 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 shows live shows so so um all in all we lost um for a while uh, the drivers of what normally keeps live broadcasts um with high ratings and we we saw the impact uh we saw the impact with uh uh, a little bit of heavier cord cutting, so particularly people in some areas in the world um, practically decided that there is no room in their houses anymore for live TV channels, uh, and they prefer to subscribe to um, like SVOD packages. And uh, I mean, not not in Europe that much. I mean, from my practical experience. Uh, we had subscribers that practically uh, unsubscribed from the premium sport packages. And of course, this impacted the uh, revenues and the forecasts. And this is not just for the operators because in the end we're just distributors of content. This is uh, something that as a domino effect uh, impacts the whole value chain. Luckily, live sport is back. I mean, yesterday here in Bulgaria was the first uh, uh, soccer game actually yes indeed live soccer game and champions league is back la liga is back tennis tournaments are coming back so practically whatever happened happened it was fantastic for us to learn and to adjust and then again if if i have to summarize what i just said those who had digitalized themselves with regards to payment collection technologies to deliver our content uh, those companies practically had a significant advantage in these tough times as compared to more classical cable court uh, Stanley, driven I have a question companies. for you. It's very simple though, because you talk about uh, live sports and I hate to interrupt you, but uh, I know that um, you have the wealth of the whole industry and I would like to give more condensed knowledge to our viewers. So um, I, don't you think that after this couple of months, um, especially the fans would really require a completely new means of getting connected between each other together, especially if this quarantine continues and the restriction measurements are happening. Uh, if no more the fans are going to be at the stadiums, do you think that the cameras that fly over the heads of the, of the players or whatever are good enough for, um, for the fans to experience through the usual digital channels the um the, the the whole field of emotions that they have and let's let's talk about this for a moment while we are expecting um, maria to join back because she really brings a lot of a lot of data i hear that she is already with us in the studio again with uh, her slides ready uh, if maria is available with us please uh, bring her to the studio and together with Stanley, we will go through the presentation and the numbers will help us. And of course, with the other two guests of ours, which I haven't, uh, who I haven't introduced yet, we, we, can, we can move on. Uh, we just expect for, for Maria to switch on her camera and uh, to start working on the uh, numbers and the presentation. Maria, if I knew that digital presentations will be such a big deal, I would have been in Spain with you personally. Um, it's a um, sweet you have to switch on your microphone you have to start showing your face and it will be very easy for us from that point on wonderful welcome now i will see you on the screen and uh, thank you you're back in the studio maria welcome back let's, hello uh, can you hear me all well now yes let's go through the presentation please let's go through the presentation so Thank you very much. I'm part of Omdia. We're going to speak about COVID impact. And I start saying that, yes, this will be a bad year. It's going to end up in a recession in 2020, affecting most countries where lockdown has happened. Since people couldn't leave the home, many people lost their jobs. They have been full of. So consumer confidence declined. This will be one of the worst crises, worse than the one we faced in 2009. The positive thing is that everything will recover next year. 
Well, I like positive. So when we look at different <laughs> sectors, which ones have been affected more, we can see that have been positives. For example, how broadband. Broadband has been more important than ever, and people rely on mobile, on broadband more than ever. E-commerce, people didn't go to go out to the shops, so they bought online more than ever as well. So e-commerce, another winner of this pandemic. But as we can see in the chart, not everything has been positive. Advertising, cinema, they have been declining. But let's focus, take into account the panelists we have today in TV, in video, what is happening here. What is happening here is that the in-home TV has increased. People are at home with their families, with their children. So they, they have increased the appetite for content, for news content, for family content. And of course, we didn't have live sports. So they needed to spend that time watching what was available in their catalogs. So many players took advantage of all catalogs. They need to provide all content since many production series have been on hold. For pay TV, Stan has talked about his experience at Gulsacom. They have been a bit, of course, saving people canceling their premium subscriptions for movies and for sports. And also, uh, many operators could not install new set of box or satellite dishes because people were not allowed to enter in your home to install new equipment. This, of course, was a problem for pay TV operators. Online streaming video, we start the presentation today saying this has been a big winner, especially services like Netflix, like Disney, like Amazon Prime Video, but not everyone experienced a positive story. Those relying on ABOT or those relying on live sports have a more difficult time. Again, for obvious reasons, cinema experienced a terrible decline since cinemas are closed. They are just reopening now around the world and advertising very negative trends. But people love TV. People have been watching more TV than ever. We say here Italians and the Spanish love TV because the Italians, they were watching six hours of TV a day and the Spanish five hours of TV a day. So across all those countries where lockdown happened, people found uh, entertainment through their video, through their TV. So this has helped people across the world. This is in Europe, but when we look at China, people were watching TV for seven hours a day. This is a big, big figure of how people spend their time during lockdown. So fantastic. I can't believe they're, they're not working at all, Maria. The video space. Very important, we say, more important than ever, the networks, broadband, because we couldn't have events like this. This fantastic virtual web it could not happen if we didn't have robust, robust broadband networks across the world. So the traffic has increased between 50 80%, sometimes putting a lot of constraint in the networks and many streaming video services saying they were going to downgrade the quality of their video, not offering 4K, maybe not to put so much uh, constraint in the networks. But people obviously have been using their networks more than ever for video, for calls, for events, for everything. Three big winners, Netflix, Prime Video, and of course, Disney. Disney will have this year more net additions than any of the video streaming places, players around the world. Big figures for Disney Plus that they just launched at the end of 2019 in the US and recently in Europe. In fact, we did a consumer survey and in the UK, did you know that Disney Plus is now the third most popular service in the UK. This was just one month after launch. How they managed so quickly to become number three, just behind Netflix and Amazon Prime Video. They arrived at the perfect time. Same in the US. One of four homes now in the US subscribe to Disney Plus. Again, very impressive in such short time what Disney Plus has achieved here. And although I keep saying Disney Plus has been a winner, of course, Disney as a whole, the company, also suffered challenges because, as we know, the thematic parks were closed. So we said the online streaming video was a benefit, a winner, but not the whole company as a whole. 
And despite every, all the headlines usually about Netflix, Amazon, Disney+, Plus, HBO Max, there are more than 1 billion Xbox subscription services around the world. 1 billion, thousands and thousands of Xbox services around the world. If we include also Xbox services like Pluto TV that David will tell us all about later, like Roku, like all the Xbox services around the world, the market becomes even more overcrowded. How can we find content with so many services available? Who can help us finding that content? These are some of the Abot services that they are launching this year and last year. And uh, according to recent statistics, the increase in Abot rise to 300% in 2019. So again, good moment for Abot services to launch, those that are free and you don't have to pay. On average, people are willing to pay for more than two pay SBOT services per home. This is when we're looking at pay SBOT services. These are around different countries in the world. We can see that thanks to lockdown, that number is on the rise in every single country, in particular in the UK. But if we take into account not only pay, but also free ABOT services, the numbers are even higher even more than seven services uh, in the US. So means there is an appetite for pay, but even more as well for ABOT to complement that offering. I want to discuss this in the panel. I would like to hear from, this, uh, from these companies that we have today here, what it means, the fact that many production, many series have not been completed because of course people couldn't uh, go to the set and finish the, what they were planning to produce this year. Are we going to have a shortage of content at the end of this year? Will we have trouble in 2021 to find new original pieces? I would like to hear from David, from Mas, from Stan, what do they think about this? Where will they find content? Also, a good topic for the panel that I would like to find out. Most of the studios are launching their own direct-to-the-consumer services. Disney Plus, HBO Max, all these companies, they go direct to the consumer. So of course, because they're going direct to the consumer, they want to keep the best content for themselves. They want to be exclusive. They want to have their originals. But what does this mean for those companies that they use to buy content from them? For example, Mass and Stars Play. Where will they find the content if people like uh, Viacom, like Pluto, like Disney, they will retain some of this content. We heard all about Friends. Friends is coming out from platforms like Netflix. It will come out from many operators. This can be an opportunity, in fact, Fleming, it can be an opportunity for many content producers, for independent producers, to produce content and fill the gaps that a series like Friends and others will leave in these platforms. So I think, again, this is a very positive story for many people that are hearing us today and they may work in content production to know gold opportunity for them to sell their content to big players like Stan or like Mass that they will be willing to buy that content. So this is very quickly what I wanted to show you. Lots of numbers, happy to share with you uh, the deck, but I will be also very interested in learning from our panelists. What do they think about the numbers they have seen today? Absolutely, thank you so much, Maria. Um, it is, um, it, it's, it's what a time for the industry. So we see the big changes. We see completely new layers coming up and down and, and uh, new opportunities, new possibilities, uh, a lot of shaking in the coal industry. And we have the right people here to comment. You already gave the floor. Allow me to introduce our two other guests and then all together to do a wonderful panel for the next 30 minutes. Uh, let me introduce you the next guest here in the studio. David Erjo is Senior Vice President of Strategy, Content Distribution and Digital for Viacom International Media Networks, Southern and Western Europe, Middle East and Africa. In this role, he is responsible for developing new business and expanding the presence of DIMN brands including MTV, Nickelodeon and Comedy Central in the regions as well as overseeing the digital and content distribution. 
Hello, David. Welcome. Hello, Dr. Bauman. Thank you for. We uh, have a very, very strong Spanish presence today here. Yeah, two, two people. <laughs> but also two Bulgarians. So, um, uh, what a wonderful gathering we are going to have. David, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, being with us. With your permission and uh, Maria's permission, I would like to introduce our next guest. And then all of us together with Stanley, we shall have a great discussion. Here is our next last guest today. Mars Sheikh is the CEO and co-founder of Stars Play, Mina's leading video streaming service that is based out of Dubai and delivers its service from Marrakesh to Karachi across 21 countries in five languages. Over the course of five years, Stars Play has received numerous industry awards and recognitions. Mas, what a bio! And uh, congratulations on all your ongoing success. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Shukram. Now we have all of us in our virtual studio. And I will leave it now to Maria, who is, uh, in this case, uh, uh, co-hosting along with me and Stanley this whole discussion. So Maria, uh, we've seen the numbers. We've seen how the, the layers are moving. Um, I will leave the floor to you now. Thank you very much. And yes, I wanted to ask the panelists, uh, starting, for example, with David, we speak a lot about paid subscription services, about Disney, about Netflix, but you, David, in particular, you are leading uh, the Pluto TV project that is an advertising bot service. Can you tell us more about it? What do you think is the future for a bot services and what happened during the pandemic, taking into account that advertising was in decline, was one of the sectors affected? What is your view about advertising video services? Thank you for uh, for the question. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, uh, one interesting thing that I see every time that I see a number from Pluto in terms of uh, active users is outdated because we're growing so fast that, you know, we are like a growing like, a, I mean, it's not 22 million uh, anymore. It's like more like 26 million. We cannot disclose these by markets, but we, we launched uh, last month in Latin America. We're going to be launching more markets. So, the company is betting really strong on, on ABOT, but it's not only kind of Viacom CBS that is betting on the rise of ABOT. Uh, we have seen recently some uh, corporate uh, movements around ABOT. So Comcast bought uh, Shumo and, uh, and Fox bought, bought, uh, bought Tubi as well. So I think there is like a, a lot of industry uh, conversations about the rise of ABOT. So we're really confident that being one of the biggest players in the, in the market, and with the strong support of our parent house like Viacom CBS, uh, in the US, for instance, we have 20, 20 no, we have 250 channels on Pluto, and this is kind of growing. We have many channels coming from uh, from our kind of own content pipeline because it's interesting to have a service which is supported by a company that produces the content. But we see more and more and more interest from independents to put the content on the platform. So uh, although, and it's true. That we've seen a decline in this kind of long term period. Yeah. The, the consumption has been increasing to the, like a rocket. And uh, we, we're starting to see money, real money, yeah. coming back to advertising, especially on digital, like in uh, services like Pluto in the US. So we, we're confident that Q3, Q4, we're going to be like a ramp up in advertising, and more especially in services like, like Pluto. So we're really confident mm -hmm. on the strong offering like, like Pluto. So you see a recovery in the advertising market in Q3, Q4, 2020. That's, that's a very positive message. Yeah, we started to see, we started to see in, in, in the message in, in the month of June. I don't want to say that we're back to normal, but yes. we recovery in June and uh, budget coming back to, uh, to linear, but also to digital, uh, digital outlets. I mean, I think I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen. But you're yeah. optimistic. Yeah, you're optimistic, but everything depends on on the, at the end of the year, there will be a, no, a, no, a rebound of the virus. But I mean, if everything goes back to normal, we kind of positive for at the end of the year and, and for next year, especially. David, something original about Pluto TV as well. We keep talking about on demand. Uh, people who like to watch on demand content, but Pluto not only has on demand, 
you are also offering life channels. Why? I assume it's because you think that despite what the many people say, linear TV is not dead and there is an appetite for linear live content. Can you explain more about why Pluto TV decided to have live channels and also linear channels and on demand? Yeah, to, to, I mean, the, the service started like a linear channel. So uh, despite the belief that can be VOD, I mean, this, we've seen like some fatigue on the VOD services. I mean, many people go into the services, they start like searching for something, they don't see anything interesting. They see child, they go to sleep or they go to do different things. Pluto is born like a free linear service and the vast majority of the consumption happens, happens on the linear channel. Is not on the VOD. We have a strong VOD offering next to the linear, but the strongest part of the consumption is on linear. linear. Yeah, that's people... a very big, that's a very strong statement, especially in a market where everyone sets everything is on demand. So if you have to say a percentage, would you say like 70% of the viewing, more, more than 70? Yeah, and we, we see, I mean, you know, Pluto is a free service, it's available in all connected devices. Yeah. Uh, but most of the viewership time happens on big stream. I mean, on smart TVs or like in connect TV or like Chrome Interesting. Fire TV. I mean, we have like strong sessions in, in mobile as well. But yeah. the biggest consumption happens on, on, on the big screen. On the biggest the screen. majority is on the, on the linear. I mean, it's, it's not based on research. It's based mm -hmm. on reality. And, uh, and this is why I think it's, it's uh, we've seen this kind of uh, M&A recently, like with mm -hmm. companies like Comcast or like uh, Fox uh, buying like uh, startups, like as we did like two years ago with Pluto. Is I think that there's a like, reality that people are starting to be not tired, but in a way sometimes people uh, desires to get home, not to think much, put something on TV, just keep watching what they offer when it's curated, and uh, we see we see this kind of behavior. Very good, David. I would like to involve in the conversation mass for Stars Play Arabia, since the Middle East is such a fascinating country, and uh, in particular what Mas has been doing with the Stars Play in that region. So, Mas, I think for Middle East as well, but I want to hear from you, the, the pandemic has been a positive in terms of people watching more content than ever. For your platform in particular, uh, you had more additions in the next three months than in five years. Is this true? Can you share with us some of those numbers? Sure. Um, so as, as you said, uh, Maria, the, the region, uh, as we call it, the Middle East and North Africa is, is a region of, uh, uh, of 21 uh, countries, Arab countries in, in, the, in the region from, um, from the Gulf countries all the way to North Africa. And, and you, you're talking about a population of about 400 million people. And, uh, and just like around the world, as the region started to go into lockdown, uh, uh, like uh, the numbers you see in Europe, we, we saw uh, similar growth in, um, in our consumption numbers. For us, the consumption on our platform uh, almost tripled uh, and uh, quadrupled in, uh, in March, April timeframe. From the from the January baseline we had, so we saw tremendous growth in um, in in last three or four months, almost four x growth in consumption. And on the subscriber on paying subscribers side, because we're a subscription video on demand service, we saw about a twenty to thirty percent growth uh, month on month uh, starting from from January. That's that's very good, Mas. And also at the same time, you have Ramadan. Was this a very different? Ramadan time that previous years, because it's a month where people usually consume a, a lot of content. What was different this year? Even more viewing than ever? Yes, so, you know, uh, uh, before COVID, our average consumption per user uh, was about uh, 30 minutes daily. Um, that average during, you know, COVID-19 peak, I would say grew to almost an hour. And, and during Ramadan, it was uh, an hour, 10 minutes. So we definitely had uh, our, our peak of consumption was during, uh, during Ramadan periods. And, and we saw the consumption shift also uh, because on our service, we, we carry, you know, we, for example, we, we have all the Showtime shows, we have Stars shows, 
we have output deals with uh, Disney and, mm. and, and Warner, but where we really saw the, the consumption and growth on, uh, was on our kids and family friendly content, uh, especially some of the, the, the Disney stunts we were doing on Marvel and Star Wars performed really well during Ramadan. Very good point that you mentioned Disney, Marvel and all that content, because uh, I agree, has been one of the most popular contents around the world. But Mas, tell us about this now. Since Disney obviously now have Disney Plus, since uh, Warner, they have HBO Max, since our friend here, David, they, they are expanding Pluto TV around the world. This, of course, changing the relation that you used to have with the studios because they would like to keep some of that content. So uh, what are you planning to do? Because I assume, can you share any sample of relationships that have changed already? Or can you tell us, uh, if you are planning to add new content coming from new players, what is your view about big studios launching direct to consumer services, pulling content away from platforms like yours? What this will mean for the future? Are you worried? Sure. Um, yeah, am I worried? There's lots of other things that worry me before, before this one. Um, okay. I, think, I think, Maria, there's, uh, there's, you have to treat each region differently. Right, so, so Middle East and North Africa from rights uh, point of view uh, is very different from, from Europe, right? Uh, so it's true that Disney uh, uh, has launched its uh, direct to consumer service in US and like you pointed out in, in UK, they're the third largest uh, SWAT service. Mm. In, in the MENA region, whether it's Disney, CBS uh, and all the other majors and including Warner, they are continuing to work with the local platforms. So for example, take Disney for example, we, they licensed their Disney Plus shows, including Mandalorian, to the, to the local pay television operator, which is OSN. And so you can watch all the Disney Plus shows on OSN service. At the same time, um, you can watch all the Star Wars movies or the Marvel movies and all the other Disney classics on, on our service. And, Correct, um, but I assume mass this will come at, at an end after a couple of years, depending on how those contracts, uh, how long the contracts will last. I, I, uh, yes, and I, you know, I, can, I cannot uh, comment on Disney's or, uh, or, or uh, Warner's strategy, mm -hmm. but, but I assume they're a commercial enterprise and they're going yeah. to evaluate how much does it cost them to acquire a subscriber in this market in 21 yep. countries? Do they want to fight their battles in UK or do they want to come of to course. That, so That's a very good point. Um, there's certainly, we have visibility for next two or three years, uh, but what happens beyond 2022, 2023, I think is, is, uh, is not as clear. But at least for next two or three years, we feel confident with, uh, with the arrangements and the contracts we have. So in two, three years, we can invite people in the audience to produce attractive content that you can buy uh, at that well, time. So, so we're already doing that. So for example, um, we earlier this year, we, we released our first original series. And, and later this year, we're releasing one more. So our goal is to, one, to continue to work with independents in yes. the market. Uh, so for example, um, you know, we, we are doing some collaborations with Sky in, in UK. We're working with Fremantle. Uh, but at the same time, we're working with local uh, producers and studios in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Very to good. Continue to produce new shows. And Mas, I'm, I'm very happy to see that we have uh, someone like you, like uh, from a streaming video service, someone like David from Viacom, and Stan representing the traditional pay TV operators. Uh, so I want to hear from Stan, what is his relationship in terms of partnerships? Are you partnering with streaming video services at the moment, Stanley? Uh, well, in this particular territory, that's not the fact yet. I mean, not yet. Uh, no, Netflix, uh, Prime, uh, Disney Plus, unfortunately, they don't have the strategy <laughs> or the focus. Uh, to sign partnerships in Central and Eastern Europe, at least in the territory where I currently am. I mean, we even had some preliminary talks with Disney Plus and it's still not even on the agenda. So I, I don't even have a timeline about Disney Plus. 
Uh, but listen, there was something that you showed as numbers with regards to the consumption of uh, broadband. I mean, what I saw on our network, for example, was around uh, 35 to 40% increase. And perhaps this is explained exactly because we don't have such a large number of streaming services uh, okay. in this territory. Um, so would you say, if I asked you as a traditional pay TV operator, if I asked you, was broadband one of the things that retained your customer? Because we speak a lot about churn, people churning from different video services, streaming, pay TV. Would you say that the fact that you provide not only video, also broadband, also mobile, help you uh, retain the customer? Was broadband one of the, your growth areas when you look at your portfolio? Hmm. Interesting. Um, listen, I, I have a very special opinion about the topic of broadband and uh, pay TV as a combination. I, I don't think the telcos are performing phenomenally in delivering uh, pay TV services. I also don't think that traditional pay TV operators with the entertainment uh, DNA, uh, mm. media companies like even UPC, etc. I don't think such companies necessarily excel in delivering telco services. Um, I think that as long as uh, we as an entertainment and media company understand what is required from us, I think broadband and any other technology, just a technology, is just means to deliver the service. What's, what, actually, what I actually implemented during um, the crisis times uh, in the country here was that I actually offered additional content, uh, a little bit smarter packaging. We also opened uh, all packages, all tiers to all subscribers during the heaviest times, during the, like the hmm. serious lockdown. Uh, but practically new content for it. Like and new... when you say new content, I assume you speak about movies, entertainment, because for Correct. you, obviously, life as sports was also a problem. So as an operator, maybe you still have to pay those carriage fees to those operators offering life sports, but Correct, consumers yeah. do not want to pay for content they do not watch. So was this the most challenging part of your video portfolio, Stanley? What, what would you say? How did you face the whole life sports uh, situation of not being able to provide that content, but having to probably pay for those carriage fees? Yeah, if I have to say it in only one sentence, we were not happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, it's complicated, of course. I mean, it, it, we also hold the responsibility towards the whole industry. I spoke with many colleagues and, and other markets as well. I spoke even to broadcasters, sport, uh, sport broadcasters in markets that I don't work with. And I tested approaches with them and they said, no, this won't work. Uh, because practically we had to pay for something for which we were not collecting money simple as that of course i mean actually my company suffered a little bit more because we have a prepaid um, approach and for the subscribers it was just very simple they they go to to um to the portal and they say i don't need the premium sport package anymore exactly but but i i really want to emphasize something i mean we, we shouldn't forget that this industry is, um, we, are, we are all a part of the whole industry. I mean, it works when we all work together. So I also think that we hold responsibility towards the broadcasters, mm. the sport broadcasters and the sport producers. Well, of course, I mean, perhaps it would be smart if uh, the soccer players in the UK stop buying Bentleys because, I mean, all of that, uh, happens with the premium money they collect from all around the world. <laughs> so I think everyone yeah. has to compromise a little bit. Uh, however, I, I want to basically um, mention something. Um, a broadcaster, a sport broadcaster, uh, I spoke with them here and I really want to um, congratulate them for the smart strategy that most of the sport broadcasters implemented. Because life is very important. However, sport is not just live sport. There is a lot of history, of there course. Is a lot of documentary, and uh, one of the sport premium sport broadcasters. He actually they implemented very rapidly um, a new programming schema. They were showing tennis, Agassi, and Sampras. I mean, when can yeah. you watch Agassi and Sampras these days? To be honest, yes, yeah. all content as we mentioned before, yeah. all catalogs, all absolutely. Content. Yeah. 
I also have to congratulate um, the sports um, license, licensors as well, because they practically opened all the licenses, regardless if mm. they had expired or not. And all the sport broadcasters now had content uh, that they could ent still entertain. I mean, we mm. shouldn't forget that we are in the entertainment business. And By the way, just uh, to remind you, we only have 10 minutes left. Uh, in the meantime, we have published a question. Do you consume more content online? We know the, the answer. We already have like 400 yes and zero no. <laughs> this never <laughs> happened with uh, our polls. But everyone, go to virtual.webit.org. Uh, you can cast your vote, even though we know the numbers already. Uh, you've got 10 minutes, um, and I look forward to see a little bit more uh, forward thinking of this amazing panel, if you may, yeah. uh, all of you. So where is the industry heading next? That's a very good question, uh, Plamen, because that's what I wanted to ask you all uh, towards the end. What is happening next in the sense that now we said people are watching more TV than ever, two hours more than in 2019. They're even willing to pay for more content than ever. We saw what happened with that movie, Trolls, $20, and people bought that movie. They didn't care because they wanted to have kids quiet at home. But do you think this changed uh, people's habits? So people from now on will be willing to pay more for transactional bot, to pay more for content. They will get addicted to watch more series than ever. Or we will go back to what everyone called the, the back to normal, that I don't like the term, the new normal. But do we think consumer behavior has changed and people are now more addicted than ever to the TV? What do you think, Mas? How consumer behavior will change uh, in 2021? Sure. So uh, I think that there's several aspects of, of COVID-19 uh, that are going to have an enduring and a more lasting effect on consumer behavior. Um, especially in this region, we've already seen people use credit card more frequently than they did previously. Um, I think the, 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 the behavior change, uh, especially towards on-demand and streaming services, I think that's going to be an enduring and a lasting change, uh, regardless of uh, what happens in the next six or nine months. So I do think as, east, uh, as the lockdown is eased, uh, the consumption will drop, but I expect uh, the, the users and the daily logins uh, to continue to uh, remain at, the, at their peak volumes, even though consumption per user will drop. Uh, but I think you, you cannot unlearn uh, something, right? So people, uh, there are some behavior changes that are going to be more lasting. Very good, very good, Master. So from your view, people are getting more used to buy things online. They're more happy to provide credit card details. So this is something that will continue in the future. More trust in the online world, buying things, paying with credit card. That, that's a very interesting point. So what do you think, David? What is the main, main change in consumer behavior going forward? I agree with uh, I agree with Matt. I mean, uh, I think people. I mean, I mean, they got used to this kind of. Uh, I think the level of consumption will go down. I mean, we're seeing here in, in Spain, people is uh, super happy to go out to the street and to go into a terrace and to see people. I mean, and these people probably before were like they were watching uh, as bot. So consumption will go down, but people will remember what they did in the past. They were like more used to these services, and uh, this is why companies like company that I work uh, would like putting kind of, uh, you know, all the kind of uh, developments around a -Bot with Pluto, but also like rolling out international global s -Bot services like uh, CS or Access internationally. So we're going to, I mean, this has helped to uh, even more the s -Bot trend that was happening. We're going to see some drops in consumption because this is normal. It cannot be sustained, but people have learned and this won't go away. So what I think is we see good times for everything that has to be with uh, a board and S-Bot moving forward. And on linear television, I think uh, it's a good time for, for production as well, because we have more and more outlets to, to sell the content to, and people still watch linear television, even the current is still decreasing, but it's still a big, big industry. So this is what we see kind of, at least, I mean, I think it's difficult yeah. to look in like a, five-year kind of a time lapse, but in the next couple of years, this is where we see things going. F fantastic. And, and Stanley, for you, what are the learnings of COVID-19? 
going forward, what would you do different or what do you think would be the trend in 2021? How would you protect yourself from things like not relying maybe so much on life sports? What do you think are the main lessons you have learned? And what are your predictions for 2021? Um, well, let, let me just clarify something. I'm, I mean, live sports wasn't such a big issue. So practically, we lost, subscriber, we lost subscribers. I mean, perhaps 30% of the subscriber base on the premium sport packages, but still 70% stayed. So it wasn't as bad as everyone thinks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, practically, again, sport is interesting as content, not necessarily when it is only live. Uh, I mean, one of, I mean, looking forward, one of my favorite jokes actually is I advise all of my friends and now I advise the whole Webit community, don't binge watch anything on Netflix because there is not going to be anything to watch next year. <laughs> I mean, let's not forget that um, this whole lockdown actually slows down the production of content as well. So many, many series were um, canceled or interrupted for an unknown period. So definitely, we practically saw the golden ages of content production. I don't think we're going back to the golden ages of content production. We were blessed to have so much drama and so much entertainment for a while. I don't think this will be sustained um, only because I don't personally see the world to get back to that physical connectivity as before. I mean, I, I actually fly these weeks and it's a sad story when you go to an airport. Mm -hmm. It's like from a horror movie, practically. Everything is closed, etc. So this is one thing. Yeah, I basically Apparently we expect... were having such a positive discussion until now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Please go ahead. Go ahead. We need to hear it. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, looking forward, what I personally think the industry should definitely consider is not to rely that much on Chinese set-top boxes. Uh, let's not forget that China is the largest producer of such equipment. Uh, and practically, whatever cord cutting, cord, uh, cord cutting we do, I practically think that the industry has to transform into a non-set-top box uh, direction. And we are there. I mean, we are almost there. It's just a question of how traditional operators like us or telecoms, actually, which are more hardware oriented, will adjust and adapt. Uh, so definitely, this is something I personally see. Um, and Stanley, what about the role of partnerships? You said nothing is happening in Eastern Europe at the moment. Do you think this will highlight again uh, life sports is not the only type of content? Do you see this will will make a dramatic change in Eastern Europe and you, we will see more partnerships from now on. Not just Netflix and Amazon, as we saw before, there are thousands and thousands of SBOT services, thematic niche services. Do you think this will be an opportunity to start the conversation with partnerships, which is the, the key word, I think, going forward yeah. and for 2021? It's, it's also a matter of a personal opinion here because I am definitely pro-partnerships. I have always advocated that a company should stay where their core business is. And I will be working for partnerships for sure. So practically hearing that from a CEO means that um, such partnerships will happen. I'm not saying that the partnerships in this region did not happen because there was no interest. It's, it's practically something that is a trend. This particular region follows uh, the trends of uh, Western Europe year and a half, two years behind. So all of that is work in progress. It just was an effect so far. So that's very good. Thank you to this opportunity at Virtual Webit. Maybe we can help making those partnerships happen faster. So I think it's a positive note. Uh, please, uh, streaming services of the world, uh, come to Eastern Europe. We are open to partnerships. I think that's a very positive message in times of crisis and difficulty. So <laughs> just to end with a very positive note. I see. The ARPU is a little really bit. The is here. Note. Yes, the ARPU is a little bit low here, but still we can we can find some. <laughs> yeah, the same applies to the Middle the East. The same yeah. applies. Uh, of course. Everywhere in the world, um, I'm very grateful to all of you joining this uh, special edition of Digital Entertainment and Media. Uh, we are absolutely having uh, a very deep dive discussion. 
uh, we see that we don't have that many thousands of people as we started here because the discussion was very professional, very uh, niche, but uh, those uh, almost 2,000 people with us at the end, I'm sure have uh, had a wealth of information that we shared with them and uh, definitely um, have heard both the positive and uh, the not so positive side of the development of the industry. We will continue tomorrow uh, meeting you with the Chief Executive Officer of Forbes, uh, Mike Federle. Uh, Mike is going to be my guest tomorrow in uh, this studio, along with uh, John Canning, who is the Executive Producer of Digital Domain. Uh, one of the veterans in the industry in the U.S. We shall be talking a lot about production because he comes from that particular domain. Now his company is called Digital Domain. Uh, we look forward to see uh, another friend, Arash Pandari for uh, uh, Vion Labs. Uh, he will be in discussion with the CTO of Microsoft, uh, Han Obase. And we shall be talking a lot about entertainment. Uh, he's from the city of uh, Asia, media and entertainment. And um, we shall see also someone who is going to help me. Furthermore, during the week, uh, we'll be joined by journalists from um, CNN. We shall have uh, journalists from BBC, from um, uh, Forbes and others joining us on discussions of the future of digital entertainment and media. Now I'm wishing you a wonderful day, wonderful evening, late night somewhere in China. And uh, I will be seeing you tomorrow exactly in um, 22 hours, 58 minutes and 11 seconds. See you tomorrow. This program is powered by the virtual.show, making your offline events virtual.